Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for a wonderful artist gallery talk this afternoon. I know we're, we're a big group, so thanks for, for gathering around. And um, as you're getting to a spot to stand where you can see, just please be mindful not to lean on walls or back up into any of the beautiful paintings around us. Um, I'm Danielle Knapp. I'm the Makash curator here at the museum. I'm so pleased to introduce Naima Naimai to you today. You may already have spent a lot of time in her beautiful show that's been on view for a couple of months and will still be on view through December, but how wonderful that she's here with us today to share on, about her work and her career. It's been such a pleasure getting to know her through this process. Uh, we at the museum and our artists are so appreciative of Paul and Anuncia, Paul Seminin and Anuncia uh, Ascala, who are here, I just lost sight of them, um, who have been such a supporter of your work and introduced your work to us. And so thank you for bringing Naima's work to Eugene. Um, I don't want to take up too much time, so uh, just I think what we'll plan to do is walk through the gallery as she talks about her work and then take some time for questions and conversation at the end. So without any further ado, I'll hand this over to you. Thank you so much for being here today. Hello. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm very glad to be here and I'm very happy for this opportunity that, that I can show my works and I can communicate with you which are probably living in other side that I've grown and we can share our thoughts and our whatever we can get from the world. So thank you very much. Uh, and also, I want to thank Geo Hart, which is not here, the museum uh, director, uh, Paul and Anuncia, and Sajjad, my husband, which all of them have a main role in this moment that I can be here and talk to you. Thank you very much. So, uh, I'm going to explain a little about uh, the exhibition. Uh, in general, and then we can go and walk and see some paintings, and after that we can talk. If you have any question, I can answer your questions. Uh, there are two series of painting in this gallery. The first series is Dreams Before Extinction. This series was about endangered animals of Iran, which uh, was based on uh, IUCN Red List, which is kind of... Uh, there is an organization, Universal, which uh, release a list of animals which are in danger uh, in all over the world. And uh, anybody can go and find an animal which is, is uh, in danger in an area that all people live, because this list is a very, very long list, unfortunately. So uh, animals in this series, in each painting, uh, there is like different story, so there is not any connection between paintings and dreams before extinction, except for me as the human, which I always try to place myself in, in a role, you know, but in different roles. So uh, I explained some of those paintings for you, which is, oh, another thing. There are like 12 paintings in this series, which just eight of them have remained, so I was able to bring them uh, here, and they are uh, on view now, so you can see them. And another thing was uh, about the series was, it, it was uh, the time that I was working on them, it was 2010 to 2012. Uh, it was the time that I spent on this series, on, all part of like studies, knowing about animals, getting help from our environmental, our, uh, from my environmentalist friends, and all people that I need their information, like scientific information about animals, uh, because my background was in art and I needed to know some um, uh, right things about each like animal to like work on. So uh, it was how the process began. And I had a show in Tehran in 2010, I guess, or, or 11. <laughs> I should try and change it. So um, after that, like the next series that you might see on the other wall is Under the Earth, Over the Moon, which is my new series. I just started, uh, paint, started the process here in Eugene last year. And it's going to be like 
uh, about 16 paintings, which these paintings are just the beginning of the story. So I might uh, explain those things later, or there might be more pieces of that series. So let's start from this piece from Dreams Before Extinction. Um, this painting is uh, the, about the Siberian crane. Um, the crane that you see here is the very last crane, very last Siberian crane of Western population. They're living in Russia, in uh, West of Siberia, I guess, and then uh, they migrate to south, to uh, north of Iran each year to spend fall and winter. Uh, there were like huge population of them before, but year by year just this number dropped because people usually hunt them in all countries, like from Russia to Iran. Uh, everyone which had the opportunity to hunt these animals, they do it. Uh, they did it, unfortunately. So uh, the number of their population dropped to about uh, less than 20 and uh, in 30 years ago and in 10 years ago there were just a couple remained who migrated to Iran each year um, and this couple because it was very important there were many NGOs and organizations which tried to help these birds to survive and it was very important for like many countries and many people who cared about environmental issues and animals but unfortunately there were just a couple and uh, a few years ago in a rainy night a uh, mate of this crane the name of this crane is hope and the name of his mate is wish because they were very important and everyone to ha wanted to have something that uh, they had a name and everyone cared about their situation and their life so um, unfortunately, in a rainy night, um, Wish was shot, and they couldn't find her, but they guessed that she was shot because it was rainy and uh, environmentalists couldn't just check everywhere, you know, it was a land, a big land, so it wasn't possible to track it exactly where she is in every moment. So, there was like hope remain as a last uh, as a last Siberian, as the last Western Siberian crane. So it was very sad story when I realized about that and, and when I read about that. And um, I decided to put her as one of the animals that I'm working on in this series. In this painting, I uh, wear a costume, uh, which is like kind of the costume that people used to have in north of Iran, which is the like, ra uh, rice land that these um, cranes usually come to spend their winter. And uh, the, I just try to match the color of this dress with this crane because I wanted to, it uh, seems like a, we are part of a family and we dress very similar. And there is a very traditional custom, custom in Iran which when a traveler wants to go to a journey, uh, usually women, mothers, wives, sisters, they usually keep the holy book of Quran. Uh, they stand in front of the door and put this Quran over the head of like everyone who wants to leave the uh, house for a long journey to make sure that he comes back, he or she comes back safely, safety. So. Uh, I did the same costume, uh, in spite I don't have any religious beliefs. I used to, I like to use this kind of language that everyone knows in like in my country because it's a way to communicate with my people uh, through like traditions, through the story that they've grown with. So it was one of those stories. And I kept this to like be like a mother or a sister or a wife or any part of like their family to is standing and want to uh, protect or ensure that this uh, hope comes back next year safely and nowadays it is uh, the background is rice farm and uh, I found this door very close to grand my grandmother house which is living in the same area which is pretty close to that area 
that uh, hope, com hope comes each year. And uh, everything, I mean, everything that you see in paintings, background, foregrounds, uh, are something real. And I really travel to different parts of my country to take pictures of those backgrounds, uh, to have something real and based on scientific fact on my, in my paintings. So this is the story of this one. Let's go to the next. I think we skip this one and we can go to, uh, I'm sorry, but Caspian Tiger over there. Yeah, that one. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So this is Caspian tiger. This is the only animal in my paint uh, in this series which is really extinct. So there is no more hope for uh, this animal to come back to our lands or, uh, you know, so. Uh, I wanted to show my grief and my mourning for this animals because I knew that there won't be any hope like the hope painting the Siberian or others. For this reason, I uh, looked at the sources that I had, like stories, facts, whatever I could find anywhere to inspire me that how to communicate with people about this pain that I have. How can I show it? So there was a very famous painting in Iran about a holy person which uh, killed in a like a war and his horse came back lonely to a place that women usually live. Uh, it was a religious painting, but it was a painting that you, could f you can find even in many books, many like walls everywhere. It's very famous. So everyone, I, I was sure that everyone knew that, that painting. The things that I did was, again, using this local custom, uh, I asked my family members to wear all those things and all of those figured in the same composition at the original painting that I wanted to, I wanted to like, um, I wanted to make exactly similar composition with that original painting. So everyone just figured in the same position and the background is the rice farm again, uh, which is the area that this animal used to live in north part in north of Iran, and uh, I placed myself here as the main role to show this kind of sadness and the most regret that I had for this animal. Uh, and I placed the exactly uh, wounds on the body as the horse in that original painting uh, has. So it's about this piece. Let's go to the next. Here. This is about Persian sturgeon, which lives, uh, the habitat is Caspian Sea in south of Russia, north of Iran. It's the biggest lake in the world. So it's not a lake, it's like a sea, an ocean. I mean, it's very deep. So uh, for this piece, uh, Persian sturgeons are usually, uh, the reason that there are like less population of them is uh, they usually hunt for uh, the highly priced caviar, which is something that many people want to like try in all over the world. So for this kind of trades, all, all country around the Caspian Sea, they try to get more of this fish as much as they can. And also there is like uh, 
pollution, water pollution for uh, oil extraction facilities, which I put it in background, but I hide it in fog, which they all also make it, make the water dirty and make it difficult for fish to breathe there. So um, for this piece, I brought my grandparents, my grandmother's house, but at this time my maternal grandmother's, it was different. <laughs> She, she used to live in Tehran, in uh, an old sector near downtown, which is not an, like very green and beautiful area with lots of trees. It was not like that. And there was a like, very narrow alley, which was a very, uh, very tiny stream running, stream running through it. So when I was like five, I used to sit on this stair, and I tied a, uh, I tied a um, thread to a stick, uh, waiting there for a fish to pass by. <laughs> and because it was a city and there was no fish there, I was just sit, sat there and just looking at that stream, waiting for and look at. I remember those small stones there, which were giving me that hope that okay, there are colorful stones there, so there might be a fish there. So. I always had this like dream and wish. And this one also was a fish. So for this, I tried to mix these both stories, like the things that I had in my mind, the memory that I had, and this kind of surgeon, which uh, could have it like, um, it had a very, very, you know, it was not in a good condition. And I could share these things, mix these things uh, together and, Give, give people my idea about how I'm sad about this. And also, uh, there is a fisherman which comes out the window, which makes this night, this painting to a nightmare because you would see the net and uh, you can predict the end of this picture that, okay, the net falls and we both would be uh, under the net. And also, it shows that there is no hope because, because usually fish breathe in the water and uh, she, uh, it is already out of water, so it shows that it's a very bad condition. There is not any hope in this picture, but in the same time, I just to embrace the fish to have the same um, destiny with it, to share my destiny with it and have the same end. So it's about this piece. Uh, the next one that I like to explain is probably, uh, this is me and my cousin. And uh, here, because I want to have stories and animals from like all other, several kinds of animals, not just fish or just mammals or, so I used bats, which are not kind of animal that everyone is in love with, but, <laughs> To find a story with bats, it was a challenge, really. Um, I found this picture of me and my cousin, which were, we were playing with toy telephones. And uh, I thought, oh, it's a good idea, because we can communicate through like waves, because they can see. So it's like having this kind of connection, which they are able to have with us. And it's kind of funny picture um, because I don't talk to them and just all of them are like this and there is just only one who is interested in talking with us. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm glad there is hope <laughs> for this. Uh, this face probably is in this exhibition, I think it's the oldest piece. Um, it was a time that I started the process, the series of painting, a series of dreams before extinction, so I still had not, didn't have enough information about the species. I didn't know that which animals are living in Iran and what's the difference between all those. There, I've, I've seen many documentaries, uh, but it was not enough to know about your own country or your own region. So this is one of those cases. I, I knew that, or I've heard that there is 
Asiatic cheetah or Persian cheetah living in Iran. And I didn't know that there is like uh, less than 40 of them living in the world. And they extinct all over the Asia from east to west, or probably Europe, I'm not sure, but it's very close. And they, it's just very few population of this Asiatic cheetah in center of Iran. So I, had, I didn't have any picture of it in that time that I've heard about, in the time that I heard about like cheetahs. So uh, I found a friend of mine in, a, in an area in Northwest which told me that don't tell anyone, but I have a skin of cheetah. Do you want to see? And I said, yes, yes, I love to see. And he showed me this picture, this kind of, this skin, sorry, and this skin. So I took some pictures in a very specific condition because I knew that it's something forbidden because it's, it's illegal to kill them or trade them or anything because they are really endangered and they're very valuable to the world, not just to Iran or Asia. So I took the pictures and for this picture, for this painting, which the name is Playmate. Again, I'm there, it's an old picture of mine, my uh, childhood, and then I use the reflection as this time, and, this, and that picture as our past. So this is me, and this is my uh, Playmate, which is a cup of cheetah, but this skin is not a skin of cheetah. I, later I realized that the pattern is not similar to this. But I kept it because it shows you that how rare this animal is and how it's difficult to know about the pattern or their... Nowadays, I mean, there are many pictures of them, but 10 years ago or before, there was not enough information about this species. And also you can see that this is past, this is now, and I'm here, and no need to explain that, what's the end of this animal. This is Loristan mountain newt, or, or imperial spotted newt, or this is one of the salamanders, kind of salamander, and they are living in two or three small spring in southwest of Iran. They are very pretty, the pattern that they have, and they are really unique animals. They're endemic animals, which are living in very just spot, small spots in the world. So they are very valuable. But because of this pattern that they have, they usually uh, have, we have problem with poaching. They got uh, trafficked for like collectors and zoos in different area which like to have this special animals. But this reason, um, for this reason, the number of them reduced and it's, they're critically endangered. The story of this is because I knew that they were uh, like trafficked by local people, I wanted to show that I want to tie them to myself in that spring to doesn't let them go and keep them with myself. So I found this costume, which is for men in that area. It has a very beautiful pattern, which I found it similar to the black and white pattern of those salamander and newt. So I added some red thread. I really I couldn't find that costume because it was, it was so expensive. So I decided to make it. So I made it, I wore it, I went to the pool and I lied down with all these rubens and threads, colorful in my hand, tied to my hands and my feet, and I was lying down on the water, asked my sisters, my family to take my picture from like the uh, upper floor and it was a <laughs> really difficult process, but it was fun to take this picture. And then later, I showed them, I tied them to this um, thread um, to show the similarities that there is like this connection between local communities, the pattern that 
have shaped in those areas for thousands of years. I'm sure that there were inspiration from the area, the animals, in the process of making those patterns in local communities. So I wanted to like have them all in the same piece, like those local dress and those uh, animals and the spring that they are living there and just mix them all and have them all together to show local people that this is part of your identity. This can be part of, this pattern is kind of something that you might got inspired, your ancestor my ancestors might got inspired by these animals or whatever they could see in those like beautiful nature or environment. So it's about this piece. I'm glad the time is good. <laughs> what time is it? Okay, so, oh, I missed that piece, but I'm not sure if I, I think I can explain it short. This one, because this one was the piece that many people asked me about. This is a, a landscape which can, you can find it everywhere around Iran or around here. It's something for many people might very, fam seems very familiar for the area that they have seen. Uh, there is a conflict always between local communities and environment, especially in like protected area or near protected area. Even here, oh, I can see that there are these kind of conflicts. Uh, this is, there is a rancher, the shepherd here, which tries to uh, protect the cattle with sheep and I took his, his picture, but I want to show this confrontation, this conflict between leopard and sheep or grazing animal because it seems that these are innocent animals and this is their land and this is their right to uh, graze in all these areas, but it's not something normal. Usually, these areas in protected area or many lands, even here, they are the lands that for million years, for thousand years, before the human just changed everything, these, were, these are the animals that used to live. And there is a, you know that, you know this, there is a cycle everywhere about everything in any environment. So, usually the reason that these lepers uh, got shot or got killed is because ranchers or their dogs usually uh, fight with leopards and the end of this is not usually something that we can predict. Usually because of the gun, there is not any hope for uh, leopards to survive in spite that these lands have been something that they've owned, they've grown in for many years because of human impact, they have to like, uh, I mean, they, uh, they lose their life. So uh, I wanted to show this confrontation. And, and again, you can see that I'm standing here uh, as to, I wanted to say that this is my flock to be at least 50-50, if not more. This wall, I, I might talk very brief about these paintings because they are another series. These three pieces, I mean this triptych, that one and the first one, these are my new series of paintings that I mentioned, Under the Earth, Over the Moon. Uh, it's about a local story, uh, which is a story of a girl, Mina, and a leopard which they became friends after you know, a long process, going to forest, collecting firewood. And finally, a guy who was in love with Mina, with a girl, shot the leopard. So it's a sad story, but since the story was, uh, happened in a village, very close to my paternal village, uh, I was able to go there, take picture of her house, take picture of the area as much as I could to have like this story, but I don't want to narrate a local story this time. I want to address 
the most recent environmental issues that we have all over the world, like global warming, climate change, poaching, everything that I can address. I'm trying to add many things under like layers, not just in front, but on the layers behind my new series. Um, there is also a short comment about this new series, which you can read here, uh, but there would be more pieces of them. And these, because this would be a series and they are going to kind of narrate their story, there would be, there would be, they are connected to each other. So with three, it's difficult to explain about the whole story. So I prefer to talk about them when there are more pieces of them and it would be easy for you then to follow those stories with more pieces. Uh, I think it would be a good time for questions and answers, if you agree. Thank you for standing all this time. <laughs> Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. painting, I started with acrylic and I end with I finished with acrylic. But later, I realized that it's better for me to start with acrylic, the background, usually, and then keep working with oil on it. So I usually finish, finish it with, uh, I continue it and finish it with oil. Yeah. Uh, not a specific one, but you can answer a question. If any of you have like question about a specific piece, you can ask. I'm here to explain. Or if you want me to explain, just let me know. <laughs> Could you talk about the piece with the moon? Mm, no. no. Do you want me to talk about it? Or if you have any question, because I... Uh, imagine that there would be 30 minutes for quest your questions. So ask your questions. If there would be, if, if there was extra time, I would explain like one or two of those pieces. Uh, it was different. She's sorry. She asked, "How was your work received in your homeland?" When there were there were like different kind of visitors in my show there. So there were environmentalists and wildlife activists, which they came there and they started crying because they knew everything about the things that I had in my paintings. They knew that this, what is this kind of sea? What's this problem? Uh, what is this animal? Because I've addressed kind of environmental issues in the background. So people who have worked with animals or environmentalists, they already knew that. So when they just faced my paintings, without any comments, they would get my message and very deeply. So it was like that. But for like other people, for artists, it was, it was different, you know that, because environmental issues is something kind of um, art experts might consider some other issues in just seeing your artworks. So it was very different, the things that I got. It was some technical point. It was some, some people just cared about how like strange this piece is, how is this composition there, or how I worked with kind of this material as an artwork. So it was positive in general, but I don't like to say that, oh, everyone like, loved my work. But in general, it was good. And I also published a catalog there explaining about the reason that each of this animal is endangered. So I wanted to like inform people in the same time that they were just watching my paintings. So it was positive in general, it was good. But it's, here it's different. I feel like more, I get more emotional message here, which is really 
uh, makes me happy that because there are many things in my paintings which are about local I've used some traditions like local stories but here I can see that the message that people get is beyond the details that I'm using in my paintings beyond the like scientific information that I address in my paintings At, and it really uh, makes my heart warm to see that this there is this concern in people all over the world about this planet and the future and environmental issues everywhere. Yeah. Yes, hi. I wanted to thank you for coming. Sure. And to express to the non-Iranian audience that you present the best manifestation of a culture that is strong, ancient, and beautiful. And thank, thank you. you for presenting the kind of thing that is common to mankind in terms of endangerment of species and so on, but also to, to tell you that you're a beautiful representation. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're very grateful to have you here, and it makes me think that have people invited you to classrooms, the younger generation, which is so enveloped in in climate change and its effect would be so moved by you and they would be inspired by you. So there's another job for you. <laughs> yeah, I'm very glad that they are like some of my friends here that they're working on environmental issues. They are doing those things and I'm always ready here for children and older age, I mean all ages and all people from all cultures and all over the world to explain my works. Yeah, I would be glad to do it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I've got a question about how you think about gender in relation to your work. Um, so part of it is how is that received mm -hmm. when you present it in Iran, mm -hmm. right? Like the man standing with the agriculture yeah. or the man doing the fishing, yeah. right? This sort of thing, or the man killing the mm -hmm. creature. So how is that sort of taken up, um, and then is it, there's a sort of linkage of, of the female with the kind of precarity or this sort of natural thing, which has also kind of been trouble, right, as like, we don't want to disassociate women with the earth or something. So could, yeah, could you just yeah, speak a little bit about the complexity of gender in this yeah, fantastic yeah. work? Uh, I've grown in a family which, in spite of being religious, many people in Iran are not, many of them are not religious nowadays, but my family, the background of my family were kind of religious family. But uh, when we were grown, there was, at least in my family, or many others probably, there were no difference between girls and boys. So I haven't grown with kind of this sense to fight for women because I couldn't sense it when like during my young age. I always had this freedom, this respect from my family that I was thinking in a different way but they always give me this respect, not just by just telling something. I could feel it, you know? So I've grown with this respect. So when, especially when I worked in this series, because it was a time that I was younger and I haven't faced with some other, other things that there are in, about gender in our society. So in this time, I didn't have had any kind of, uh, I wasn't biased and I had no like, kind of comments about genders. But the only thing that was important to me was to picture something that is based on fact, something that is real. So I did try not to pretend that, oh, I am a very poor woman, a very poor girl with no ability to do anything, and there are like those men who want to kill everyone and everything, and they want to like, you know, <laughs> so if there is men in my painting, the reason is because they were men, or he was man. If it wasn't, if the one who go for fish was woman, I placed a woman there. So the reason that you see there are men, and I'm sorry that the usually this is a kind of negative role that they all have, men in my paintings, but the reason for that is usually Unfortunately, hunters are, or they used to be men, and there would be less number of women doing those things. 
that is the reason. But I agree with you in this piece, this kind of confrontation about uh, my flock and a rancher flock. It really shows that this man and this woman, but I was really angry. And I knew that those ranchers are usually men. So I just placed him and I placed myself and I wore that red color this time to like show my anger. <laughs> and so, yeah, but that was the idea. Yeah. In a lot of your paintings, my daughters saw this. Is this your signature? Yeah, there is my signature. It's a little. Let me tell you something. There's a secret. New paintings are not finished yet because they don't have signature yet. I usually, I don't have any idea that when I can say that each painting is finished. So they haven't signed yet, but there is kind of, this is a kind of Persian cat, uh, calligraphy with my first name and na uh, last name in a round shape. I usually placed it very close to me in every piece. So in Dreams Before Extinction, you can find those small kind of stamps of my first name and last name as my signature. Yeah, that was it. Is this supposed to be a triptych here, these three? Uh, is this a series of three? Yeah, yeah, this one is triptych. And this, yeah, and this, and this space between the, those pieces are intentionally. Uh, can you tell me what time is it? Quarter? Okay, so. I have a little time, okay, I explain. This, this triptych, uh, this is a very old picture of my paternal family, like about 50 years ago. And there was a very small yellow, yellowish kind of um, photograph that I had. So I had to work on colors to bring the real colors up to scan it and enlarge it to work on. And, um, Nowadays, there is not this kind of beautiful, colorful costumes in Iran because they have changed kind of those, at, those outfits even in very small village that these people used to live. So I, I, painted, I painted them here. Uh, this woman, my father, aunt, yes, which her name was Stay. Her name means Stay. I placed this infant of a roe deer in her hogs because the baby which was in her hog later became hunter. So I replaced him with this baby roe deer and I placed those antler on her mother's head to the time that, for the time that when he see this painting, he immediately see his mother in a role that, in a role of the animals that he usually tries to find and kill. So this is the point, but also because this is Mina and Leopard series, I wanted to not address just my family. I placed the leopard in the left. I placed myself here as a human, which is separated from family, but uh, with a background which has like wildfire which is a problem we have everywhere because of global warming and climate change, which is destroying our forest, which is destroying your lands. So there are those addresses in like background of my picture. So I separated me now from Leopard. I separated me from my family. And in the centerpiece, you can see the time that a human, it's the past. It was a time that human and animals used to be in peace uh, in local communities. Like, you know, a half a decade, a decade ago, like 50 years ago. Now it's getting worse everywhere. So it's the thing that is the points behind this painting. Uh, for Moon, I don't know if I explained this one. Uh, 
That one, I just t t t talk very briefly about that piece. That piece is a scene of the book of, Dreams of uh, Mina and Leopard. It, because at the end of that story, they says that uh, Leopard was shot, and Mina went to forest. Mina escaped, the, left the village and villagers to, because she, got, she had very pain of like killing that leopard who was uh, his, her friend. So she left. And also, it was the uh, ending that people made it that when the leopard was shot, his blood went through the s snows, and in the next springs, puppies grew from his blood. It's exactly something that was in the story, but I found it very beautiful, and I decided it was not based on facts <laughs> or scientific information, but it was very moving, so I decided to keep that and just picture that scene. And the last one, The moon falls a thousand times. Uh, sorry, I should wait a little for you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The moon falls a thousand times. It's not directly about the Mina and Leopard. It was, there is this kind of myth in our literature and in some Eastern European literature about the story of uh, moons and leopards, which the reason that usually leopards die in myths is like a uh, leopard is a very proud animal. He wants to, he, she, sorry, in our language we don't have gender. They want to be above all other species. So one night he goes up a rock, he climbed up a, climbs up a rock and he see that, oh, there is a moon there in the sky. So he got angry and he jumped he, she, they jumped to catch it and defeat it. So he, she fell and died. For this piece, I tried to, to have this kind of last scene of Mina and Leopard, which Mina is doing this funeral uh, in the forest, the time that Mina leaves the village to forest forever. Again, all those details that you see in background, they are all real, and I took all pictures in, around that village. So there is a very beautiful forest there. And there was this pass. So uh, me or Mina is carrying this leopard from over the moon. I, like, I, I brought down all those moons from the sky to to respect Leopard, to do his funeral from all this moon that uh, he wishes always to be above. So this is kind of respecting Leopard and uh, getting the value of moon defeated, you know, pour it in uh, many of those under their feet. The, and this is like the message of this painting. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Color red, what red means? Color red. Uh, um, color red in Eastern culture usually is a color of life and color of happiness. In many countries, you, before, the brides usually wear red. It has kind of, it's the color of excitement, color of li life. But in the same time, it can be color of death because of the blood. And I like this kind of contradiction. I love this uh, color which can be a sign of life and can represent life and excitement and something real like flowers. And also in the same time, it can be a color of blood, which I felt that in some scenes I'm like bloody. So I like to have this, yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much for being here and listening to my work.